Hello everyone. Have you ever wondered what made up a historical cozy mystery novel? I am dissecting one today to find out. I'm talking about Death at Wentwater Court. It's the first book in Carola Dunn's historical cozy mystery series with Daisy Dalrymple. Hello everyone, welcome back to Juanita's Creative Corner. I am your host, Juanita, and if you missed the first video in this series, you may want to go back and watch it as I gave a brief description about all the themes that I'm covering in the series and also gave you some basic aspects of a cozy mystery genre itself. I will link the first video in the cards above. And in this video, I'm only going to be talking about the historical cozy mystery. And I found two resources online. The first is Five Common Elements of Historical Fiction. It's from Masterclass. And the second one is A Cozy Mystery 4X Structure created by Pamela Cohn Drub. And that is from Noveler. And I put both websites down below in the description. How this is going to work is I'm going to talk about the structure. I'm going to see how the book matches up to it. And then I might talk about some historical elements afterwards. The novel I'll be talking about today was first published in 1994 called Death at Wentwater Court. Since then, the author Carola Dunn has written 23 books in the series. Let's get to it. Act 1, The Mystery Begins, makes up 25% of the story. And Stage 1 is where your readers meet your sleuth. Your sleuth's goals and motivations need to be clear right away. Your readers need to connect with him or her. As the mystery begins, Daisy Dalrymple starts her journey as a novice journalist and photographer on her first assignment for Town & Country magazine in Hampshire, England. So we get a brief description of Daisy. She has honey brown colored hair, cheerful blue eyes, freckles, and a small brown mole, which is apparently the bane of her existence. Her dress is more fashionable than practical. She wears thin scarves and high heels while traveling by train in a snowy January. And she is the daughter of a Viscount, which makes her the honorable Daisy Dalrymple. She needs to prove to herself and others that she can make it on her own. She can be professional. Daisy may have used her social connections to gain access to this assignment, but she is also very tenacious. She invents a fictitious photographer named Mr. Coswell to get this job. The author establishes the time frame in which Daisy is living in by having her read a newspaper on the train. It's dated January 2nd of 1923. The historical references that she includes is mentions of Mussolini's speech in Italy, uh, Germany's raising, no, Germany's rising inflation, and an article about the latest wonders from Tutankhamun's tomb, King Tut. Then she spots an article that sounds more familiar to her. It's a Flatberg's burglary. People were stealing jewelry from uh, manor houses after balls. And the Flatbergs are a people or a family that she knows. She's familiar with them. Stage two is the setting. It's where the story takes place, and the readers also want to know how the sleuth fits into the setting. And as I said before, Daisy is a daughter of a Viscount, so she is used to being in this kind of um, location. The author dedicates a paragraph or two to the architectural design of the building and landscape. And the author also gives a description of a frozen lake in which a group of people are ice skating on and a footbridge that they can go under. And it also shows how Daisy is welcomed by the family at the manor. They treat her like a guest, even though she's there to write a story about the household and take pictures of the area. The readers get to meet the whole cast of characters within the first couple of chapters. The first group were the ice skaters that she ran into when she first arrived. And then later, when they all went inside, she met the rest of them. From the top, there is the Earl Henry Wentwater and his new young bride, Lady Annabel. The Earl's sister, Josephine, and Josephine's husband, Hugh Minton. The Earl's children, 
James, Marjorie, Wilfred, and Geoffrey. Fenella, who is engaged to the eldest son, James, and her brother, Philip, are also in residence. The only odd man out, besides Daisy, is Lord Stephen Astwick. He, she spends the evening with them and gets to observe them in their more intimate settings. The third stage is something doesn't feel right, where you, your reader sees a subtle change in the lives of the characters. Maybe some foreshadowing for future events as well. For Daisy, after meeting everyone and observing them during luncheon, she realizes that not all is as it seems. There is a lot of tension in the air, and most of it surrounding Lady Annabel and Lord Stephen. And Daisy asks the maid servant to draw her a bath later on, and she is in awe and wonder at the large bathtubs. They're so tall that you have to have a step stool to get in and out of it, and they have brass taps in the shape of animals. And she thought that was really cool. And then, of course, the maid puts in verbena bath salts because apparently there is hard water there. Before dinner, Daisy takes some photos of the family in, in the Great Hall. As a historical fact, she uses a camera that, an old-fashioned camera that uses an old magnesium flashlight. Whenever the flash goes off, it leaves a huge cloud of smoke whenever, wherever it's taken. Stage four is the turning point. This marks the end of Act 1. It's usually when the crime or murder is discovered. The next morning, James and Fenella ask Daisy if she'd like to go ice skating, and she agrees. Of course, she brings her camera along because she wants to finish off the roll of film that she started the night before so she can develop them. As they arrive at the lake, James and Fenella go ahead and start ice skating while Daisy sets up her camera. Under the bridge, there is a huge hole in the ice. And in its inky depths, the body of Lord Stephen Astwick is found floating, face down, face down. Act two is the investigation begins, and this makes up 20, or thirty-five percent of the story. And it's stage five. There are games afoot. In this section, your readers will learn how or why your sleuth is getting involved in the investigation. Naturally. Fenella is upset. She gets sent back up to the manor to fetch the Earl. And Daisy took more photos of the crime scene, basically, while James went and got a boat hook or gaffer to get the body out. He comes back and she and he together pull Stephen's body free of the water. The Earl and Hugh Menton arrive at the scene and they agree to bring in an inspector from Scotland Yard instead of instead of contacting their own local Constable Weatherby. Constable Weatherby is very critical of the family and would definitely give trouble. Daisy was asked to take some additional photos of the area before the body was removed to the boathouse. And when she developed the photos later, she found her first clue. She notices strange marks on the ice near the edge of the hole. At first she thought they were just ice skating blade marks, but in the contrasting light under the bridge she noticed that they were shorter and was very suspicious of them. She believed that they could be axe marks. The chief inspector Alec Fletcher from Scotland Yard arrived and he'd already interviewed James and Fenella. He wanted to interview Daisy as well. So she went to answer his questions and after lunch, then she tells him about the photos that she took and urges him to review them. And he agrees and he goes and takes a look at them and of course he agrees with her assumptions as well. They look like ax marks and and so he needed to get some more research on that. So they go down to the scene of the accident. Of course, she brings her camera and he asks her to take more pictures. And the second clue, the ice was very firm. It wasn't flimsy, it wasn't fragile. So they think that somebody definitely cut the ice because if somebody fell through, there would be radiating cracks and there would be ice floating in there. It wouldn't just go away. It was no accident, he was murdered. So he saw how insightful Daisy could be. So since the inspector was alone due to other cases in the area, uh, he asked her to act as his stenographer, which is kind of like the secretary. So she does that for the day. And then we come across stage six. 
which is the unusual suspects. And this is where your reader learns of all the suspects and their possible motives and alibis. And then there is stage seven, which is the villain acts, which is when the guilty party or parties try to thwart the investigation by throwing them off the scent. This is when people try to plant evidence or point fingers. Stage six and seven seem to be intertwined in this particular novel. So before the inspector can start his interviews, he has to go to the Earl and request permission to interview people. The Earl finally agrees, even though he was very reluctant at first. I think the Earl thought it was just an accidental drowning and now they've found proof that possibly there is an, not an accident, that it's an actual murder. So they need to investigate further. So before Daisy and he start interviewing these people, he, he needs to find out a little bit more about each of them and their movements from the night before. So he talks to Daisy and gets her input on them. And then he starts bringing people in to interview them. When the interviews finally begin, the first one that comes in is Philip. Now Philip is, uh, is an old schoolmate of Daisy's brother who actually died in the war, in the trenches. And they know each other very well from, ch from childhood. So Philip is a friend and the only reason why he's there is to keep his sister company who is engaged to the eldest son, James. Just to give you a little bit of background. <laughs> so they learn from Philip that he had some business dealings with Lord Stephen. And that's about it so far. <clears throat> and then the Earl's sister, Josephine, comes in and talks to him. And she tells how Lord Stephen is an utter cad. That's what her words. And she, she starts to tell them about how many women in town, married women in town, have been wronged by him. So he's taken up with all these married women. And, and then she like goes through a whole list of them too. She like names out 10 people, 10 women who he has had dealings with in town. He's a womanizer, I think. And then uh, Josephine's husband, Hugh Minton, comes in and they speak of his business dealings. Hugh Minton never had any business dealings with Lord Stephen, but he knows that, that he is a pretty much a scoundrel. Um, and Hugh, <laughs> Hugh has my favorite line in the whole book. Okay, so he's, he's not a very vocal man. He doesn't have much face time in the book, but he does say something that really gets me. He says, Stephen Astwick was a swindler, Mr. Fletcher. He never did anything straight if he could take a penny more by doing it crooked. Coolest line in the whole book. After the interview with Philip, Josephine, and Hugh Minton, they, he and Daisy discuss a few things. Um... They talk about how there must be a lot of really angry husbands out there and also a lot of angry business partners after his blood. He was not a nice guy. He was not a good guy. And the list of people that wanted to do him in is getting pretty big. And then actually the inspector confided something to Daisy that she's not allowed to talk about to anybody else. But the women that Josephine mentioned in, his, in her story, in her interview, they were familiar to him. The other case that he's working on right now is the jewelry thief case. The ladies that were mentioned in the story are tied to that case. So basically the women in that story had jewelry stolen from them. Stephen Astwick must have some kind of dealings with these women and something else that happens during this brief um, collaboration. They realize that Stephen went to the water and they went down to the lake and that's where he drowned but they couldn't find any boots they didn't know if there were any boots down there um so they couldn't figure out how he got down there because he wouldn't wear his ice skates to walk down there he he was wearing his ice skates but the boots were nowhere to be found so that was another mystery that they needed to solve so the next person that comes in is james he's the eldest son and he talks about Stephen and Annabelle's supposed love affair and history in Italy. 
he does not trust her at all. He thinks that she's up to no good, and he's absolutely disgusted with her. And then next is Jeffrey. He is the youngest son, and that morning he had left before breakfast, and he went to a friend's house, a friend's manor. It's kind of like a nearby farm, but the he and this other boy went to school together, so they were just hanging out. And he had breakfast at their house, and then they went riding on horses or something. But that was that. And he confirmed that he had not seen Lord Stephen anywhere out there as he was leaving to go to his friend's house. And this is the point where, where the inspector's people finally get there. They finally arrive. So it's Sergeant Tring and Detective Constable Piper. And they interrupted while he was interviewing Jeffrey. And Tring and Piper talk about how they stopped a vehicle and arrested the man who is supposedly Lord Stephen's driver or his manservant. They put him in jail until they can find out more about what's going on because they know that Stephen Astwick is dead, but they don't know how he got dead. And, and this manservant may have been the one that did it. So they have him locked away until he talks. They discover that the car that was fitting Lord Stephen's car's description um, was also seen at the locations where some of those jewelry thefts had been reported. The next we have Wilfred. He is the third son. And he admits that he invited Lord Stephen, though he was not friends with him. He despised him. He dis disliked him greatly. And the only reason why he did invite them, him is because he owed money. He owed Lord Stephen money. Wilfred was very glad that he was dead because now he doesn't have to pay him any money. And he also mentioned how Lord Stephen had boasted about waking up early and doing his exercise outdoors. And he pretty much told everyone the night before that he was going ice skating in the morning. He also recalled a conversation that was with Philip Petrie. He thought it was a good idea, so he planned on joining Lord Stephen in the morning. For the Earl, Lord Wentwater, when he comes in for his interview, he explains why Lord Stephen was not thrown out right away and he was allowed to stay because he had a family obligation to allow Stephen to be there and if he would have denied him entrance or made him go away, it would have been pretty dis dishonorable to the family. So they would offend them by doing that. So he had no choice but to let him say it was an obligation. He had to. So that's the way things were back then, I guess. He also claimed that, I mean, everybody's talking about the Annabelle and Astwick thing. And they always, they're trying to say that they were, you know, intimate with each other. They were lovers or whatever. And, you know, the Earl exclaimed that Annabelle and he were not lovers. And... They don't know what they're talking about, and then he says that he trusts her. He, she would not do that to him. So, And then they asked him if they could have permission to, to search Stephen's room, and of course they he allowed it. Okay, so the next person up, Lady Annabelle. And she admitted that Stephen was actually blackmailing her, and he threatened to betray her if... He, if she did not become his mistress. And then she went on to say that she didn't, or he didn't really want her, he just wanted revenge for past issues. So apparently they first met in Italy and she was married to a man named Rupert there. And um, I think Lord Stephen kept trying to seduce her basically and Rupert put an end to it. But you know, she said that Lord Stephen is a fiend and, you know, he just wouldn't go away, basically. The next stage is stage eight, which is the cycle of theories. And the investigators get together and they, they test these theories and try to see if they can, you know, clear some of the suspects out of the list. And so they're sifting through the clues from earlier, Daisy and he, and the other police officers, the other policemen were there too. Um, so they go over all the information that they gained from the household, too, because while he was interviewing the family, the other people, the other guys, um, Tring and Piper, they were interviewing the household staff. 
And so they put all of this information together and they found out that the gardeners that went down to the lake to clean the area up after the body had been found and moved, they remembered carrying boots up there and they couldn't say for sure if they were Stephen's boots or not. So they couldn't, they didn't have any good answers for them. So Piper and Chang came back and they had talked to the man in jail. He, he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't give them any information. And in the car that was seen around where the thefts were taking place, they did not match. The plates didn't match. Tring and Piper, when they had their permission to go look at Lord Stephen's room, they go in there and start searching. And Daisy joins them a few minutes later, of course, because that's how she do. <laughs> No, she um, goes in there, and of course, it's at that time that something is actually found when she was in the room to witness it. And pretty much Piper, he was in the closet, like going through pockets and stuff, and he found an envelope in there. And they said that that the blackguard was planning to scarper or something like that, which is basically the man was planning on um, running out, getting out of Dodge, running away, whatever. He was planning on a leave. He was leaving. Um, apparently what was in the envelope was tickets to a ship that was out of port at 3 o'clock. After they find this envelope, they go to Fletcher and they show him what was inside the envelope. And they also found a briefcase. A briefcase. And I think when Piper was going through the manservant's belongings, they found a piece of paper in there that had some numbers on it. And he remembered the numbers that were found on the piece of paper that was in the pocket, and he used those numbers to try to open this, this briefcase. It had a lock on it. So and he, they opened the briefcase. They, he was able to see what was inside. This briefcase that was found in Lord Stephen's room had some bear bonds in there and some jewelry. Alec and Tom, which is Tom Tring, they go back to the police station because they want to talk to this manservant again and get him to talk. Now they have a little bit more information to go off of. It's, it's pretty clear that Lord Stephen was complicit in this. Stage nine is another turning point. Which brings more trouble, of course. Tensions are spiking again, and people get into arguments and silly little things like that. Um, so that evening, the remaining guests gather into the Great Hall again, and, you know, Daisy is watching for signs of guilt or anger. She's keeping her eyes and ears open, let's put it that way. And she and Annabelle have a conversation, and Annabelle confides in Daisy, saying that her family did not approve of Rupert, the one that she was married to in Italy. They didn't approve of him, so they ran off together. They got closer together, they bonded a little bit. And then James, the eldest son, who we all know does not like Annabelle, he says really, really crassly that he looked straight at Annabelle, first of all. Okay, let's make no mistake about who he was talking about in this next part. He was looking straight at her and he said that there was only one person with good reason to want Astwick dead with the motive to get rid of a troublesome lover. And Jeffrey, the youngest son, did not like this at all. And his temper flared and he started beating up James, beating him up, yes. And Wilfred and Philip pulled him off, right? So. Did you notice that there is one person missing in all of this? The, the Earl's daughter, Marjorie. She's nowhere to be found because it was pretty clear in the beginning of the book that Marjorie is in love with this guy. She was in love with him. And she was flirting with him pretty hard before he was murdered. And he, he didn't want nothing to do with her. He was after Annabelle. And... And she didn't figure that out until much, much later. But anyway, after she found out that he was dead, she was pretty upset. She, she'd spent the whole day in her room. And I think the doctor had been to see her and gave her some kind of medicine to help her calm down or something. Kind of like the equivalent of Valium today. And nobody has really talked to her since then. Act 3 starts now. Rising tensions make up 20% of the story. And it's stage 10, the stakes rise. And this is when your sleuth digs in and tries to find out who the villain is, tries to figure out who murdered him. And 
the accusations are getting tossed around and then some people might be in danger. Um, they want to protect other people, their trusted friends. They, they're going to get accused of something and they need to stop that. So this is basically what happened to Daisy. Daisy is now friends with uh, Annabelle. She thinks she's nice and they're, they're pals. So she doesn't want her to get accused of murder. And so she's trying to do everything she can to help her. So when the inspector left, he left Piper in charge and told him not to let anyone leave. So the next morning, Daisy wakes up to hear Philip trying to leave. Philip and Finella are trying to leave and Daisy stops them from going. She says that the inspector told everyone to stay put and you know, he, he's probably not gonna have a problem with them leaving. As soon as he gets back, he can just have a quick word with them and then they can be out the door. So they end up staying and they go into the breakfast room and as soon as everybody else was out of the room, it was just Daisy and Fenella. She wanted to get the scoop on why they were trying to leave so quickly. I mean, she didn't understand what's going on. And after last night's events, she just simply could not go through with the marriage anymore. So she wants to leave and she doesn't want to face anybody. That's why she was trying to get out of there so quickly. She didn't want to face anybody. She just wanted to be out of there. After breakfast, Daisy and Fenella, or Fenella go to the dark room again. So Daisy's reviewing all the pictures of when the family were together. She was taking a, a photo of the family. And he wanted just the, like, the blood relations to be in this photo. So that meant that his wife was not in the photo. And Lord Astwick was not in the photo. photo. So... They were apparently in a different room and they came into the room together and when Daisy snapped the picture of them, she didn't see it before, but Lord Wentwater and Jeffrey, they both had these looks on their faces that looked like they were very angry or they were anguished about something. They were just really angry. Um, and it was directed towards Lord Stephen, so that immediately put her into the thought that they were possibly guilty of murder. After that, Daisy was um, requested in Annabelle's room. So she went and spoke to Annabelle and she said that James was going to be sent away because of what he did last night. And she says that her husband regretted not having known what James was up to, how James was treating her, because he's been having these really snide comments like that ever since they met, basically. And Lord... Lord Wentwater had no idea. The Earl had no idea. So he felt bad about that. And about not defending her. Like, Jeffrey obviously defended her. Stage 11. The final theory is when the sleuth narrows down on a suspect. But then, that lead proves to be false. In this particular case, Daisy and the chief inspector discuss the photo in which Lord Wentwater and Jeffrey gave the, the looks that could kill to Stephen, and that pretty much rose them to the top of the suspect list in his eyes, and he believed that it looked like it could be Lord Wentwater because he believed maybe, maybe they were having an affair despite what he said before, and maybe that made him extremely angry at him, jealous, and it killed him in a crime of passion. And Jeffrey, the look that he was giving, it gave a look of anguish because, you know, he defended her and, and they believed that that look meant that he was in love with Annabelle. So they thought that maybe Jeffrey could have killed Lord Stephen to defend Annabelle's honor. And both men, both Lord Wentwater and Jeffrey, had the strength to take the axe out there with the ice and, and cut the hole in the ice. Finally, after a day and a half, he gets to talk to Marjorie. And Marjorie admits to being in love with Mr. Stephen Astwick. And um, suddenly she realized that he never felt the same way about her. And he realized that he was just using her to get to Annabelle. Because once he arrived, he, he didn't have anything to do with her. He just completely ignored her. So... She was upset about that, and so the inspector believed that Marjorie could possibly have a motive for murder as well, out of pure jealousy. 
after last night's incidents between Jeffrey and James, um, the inspector wanted to re-interview some people. So Jeffrey says that James was obviously lying about what he said about his stepmother. There's no way she's having an affair. There's no way she was a murderer. She, she is like an angel, right? Because he's in love with her. And then they asked if his father knew, and he was like, no, he can't know that because he... He believed that if his father were to find out that he was in love with Annabelle, that he would be very angry with him and her. So after that, Annabelle came in. Annabelle was very worried, too, that if the Earl found out that Jeffrey was in love with her, that he would be very angry. When it comes down to it, though, she says that she would rather be accused of murdering him than admit that she was actually having an affair with him. And next came Lord Wentwater, the Earl himself, and he gave excuses why his wife did not repel Stephen's advances. Um, basically, she was a young girl, right? So she's much younger. She doesn't know how to run a household, and she did not want to offend anybody. She came from a very different lifestyle, and she was pretty much, she didn't know how to be a hostess, and. She knew that Stephen was from an affluential family and they couldn't, um, she didn't want to offend him or anybody else. She didn't want to, she's been trying so hard to be a good wife and run the household like a proper person should and she just doesn't know how to do that. That's why his wife never told him to get lost. Of course, he was worried about interfering in this process. Because if Lord Wentwater interfered with Stephen's behavior and then she would believe that he didn't trust her and that would upset her too. Or even that James could have done it to frame Annabelle and that's something that Lord Wentwater had not thought of before and this reaction to what James could possibly have done to frame her um, that really really upset him so I think the inspector believed that possibly Lord Wentwater was innocent because of this and it was a, a true reaction to such a statement that he had never thought of before, and he thought it was just a wretched thing to say. So after the Lord went water, it was James again. So James, when he was in there yesterday, he was a pompous butt, pretty much. Um, he was overconfident and very happy to be in the upper class where he can pretty much get away with anything. Um, his, basically, it was mentioned that his father had respect from the community and from the people, um, and I think James was trying to gain that respect, but he, he has to earn it. He didn't understand that part. He has to earn the respect, and he believes it should be his given right to be respected, and it just doesn't work like that, and that's kind of his attitude towards everything, but today... After Jeffrey had, you know, cold clocked him, um, punched him in the jaw, he, uh, he had this big bruise and he, he just wasn't the same guy he was the day before. He was kind of downtrodden and upset. I think he was probably feeling pretty ashamed of himself and, you know, he's being sent away so he's probably not happy about that either. And he said that what happened the night before, the remarks that he made, he was only kidding about them. And nobody ever would have thought anything different if Jeffrey had not have, you know, attacked him like that. Um, it was a joke. Everybody knew it but him. James believed that the death was an accident, not murder. And the inspector claimed that he could have tampered with the ice to frame Annabelle. Because it's no secret that he despises her. But... And because she was a threat to his inheritance, it's possible that James could have tampered with the ice to make um, Lord Stephen fall through the ice. The next one that comes in is Wilfred again. And Wilfred was more like a, a witness to it, and he kind of pulled Jeffrey off James last night, so he didn't get his skull punched in. Um, so... He pretty much admitted that he was happy that Lord Stephen was dead. He kind of like a reiteration of what he said the last time because now he's freed from his debt that he owed him. And, you know, the inspector, the inspector liked him. 
he didn't think that, you know, he was capable of murdering anybody, and he, he just didn't, he didn't believe that he did it, but he couldn't quite count him out yet. So he, he kept him on the page. He kept him on the list of suspects, even though he pretty much, in his mind anyway, crossed him off the list. But, and Daisy and the inspector discussed the interviews again, and they try to piece together what could have happened. So the inspector gets called away on the other case that he was working. Um, and Daisy is left there to keep researching stuff if she wanted to and do her article. And so she pretty much, she goes and she talks to some people and gets to get some answers to her questions. And, you know, while she was there, um, Piper was left behind as well to watch over the situation and make sure nobody left while Daisy was talking to people and researching and working on her photos. Um, the pathologist calls and gives Piper some information. Um, the pathologist was the one who did an autopsy on Lord Stephen and he said that, you know, the timeline didn't fit because he had food in his stomach still. So he says that Lord Stephen died only a few hours after he ate dinner, which meant that it changed everything. Instead of the murderer taking place in the morning, he took it took place the night before. So everything had changed. Stage 12 is the final suspects, which is, this is the part which the, the sleuth makes a last ditch attempt to unmask the villain. And they're pretty much scrambling at this point. In light of this new evidence, Daisy tries to remember who was present in the Great Hall the night before, or the night of the murder. He recalled that Philip and Wilfred had gone to the billiards room to play pool. Annabelle left because she was tired and said it had been a long day. Lord Stephen left not long after she did. And then Josephine, James, Marjorie, and Hugh played cards. So Philip and Wilfred returned from the billiards room and they suggested that they play rummy. So those two, Fenella and Daisy, play cards with them. And she noticed that Jeffrey had disappeared. She didn't know where he was. And after they play cards and they were um, listening to the end of the night weather report from the next day, which was, took place at midnight, I think they said. So after that, she was going back to her room and she happened to pass by Lord Wentwater's study and he was in there reading at the fireplace. Another call from the pathologist came back. Piper and Daisy learned that the water that was found in Lord Stephen's lungs was not lake water. It was bath water. It was he found he found soap and bath crystals and bath salts in his lungs. So Essentially, Lord Stephen was not drowned in the lake. He was drowned in his bathtub. And so this has really, really changed a lot of things, okay? Because not only was he not murdered that morning, he was murdered the night before and in his own bathtub. So um, the time frame is like really narrowing down. And then we're coming to Act 4, um, the final confrontation. This makes up 20% of the book. And this is the part that is going to have spoilers. So if you planned on reading this book that was, you know, published in 1994, don't be mad at me if you keep listening, okay? Because you're going to hear who did it. It's coming up, all right? Just be warned, be warned, okay? Okay, here we go. Stage 13 is the lowest point. Okay, so this is when the sleuth knows who the murderer is or prepares to confront them. Um, and this could be destroying evidence, escaping, or even death of a witness. Okay, now, but I have to say, at this point in time, the story does not quite match up to the structure that I found online, because she doesn't actually know yet, but she's about to find out in this particular part. So Daisy sits and she tries to think of who could have done it, who could have had access to Lord Stephen's bathroom, and how the manor is set up. There are bedrooms on each side, and the bathroom's in the middle, and they connect. So 
there's a shared bathroom. So who shared his bathroom? It was Jeffrey. Jeffrey and Lord Stephen shared a bathroom. She wants to investigate this a little bit further, so she goes to Lord Stephen's bathroom, and she starts looking around, trying to find out some evidence, trying to see if she could tell if it took place in there or not. Lo and behold, who comes to the door but Jeffrey? Jeffrey catches her in there. And then, of course, one thing leads to another, and he ends up confessing everything. And he was like, oh, God, you, you think I killed him now, don't you? And she's like, well, did you? And he's like, I didn't mean to. It was like a nightmare. I couldn't wake up from him. Yeah, very dramatic. It was the audiobook, not me. Okay, but anyway, um, he didn't mean to kill him, basically. Um, and then he hasn't explained how it happened yet. But he just said it was an accident. He didn't mean to do it, and you have to believe me and all that stuff. So, but, and he says that um, he will explain everything to the inspector when he returns, but first he needs to talk to his father. He needs his father to hear it first. And so they leave together, and they go try to find the Earl, and they find him, and they they pretty much they go to a room together to talk. And just as Jeffrey is about to tell his father exactly what happened, that is when Annabelle comes to the door and says, "You can't believe I'm gonna let you take the blame for yourself." You know, so so whatever happened involved her as well. So she comes in. And she doesn't want Jeffy to take the whole blame because part of it's her fault too. She had a piece in this. And basically she says that when she went up to the room that night, she took a bath. She had her maidservant draw a bath for her. And then they, she dismissed her for the evening and she was in the bath. Then she was getting out. And when she did that, somebody entered the room and it was Lord Stephen Astwick. And... He pretty much, you know, was about two seconds away from uh, assaulting her when Jeffrey heard her screams and came in. And Jeffrey did the same thing to him as he did to, Je or to James before. He, like, punched him. And, and, of course, Jeffrey went after her to make sure she was okay. And he goes back in there, and Lord Stephen is there. He is draped over the bathtub, and pretty much his head and shoulders was underwater. And, um, so whenever he pulled him out, he tried to revive him. It didn't work. He, um, Stephen had a gash on his forehead and they determined that possibly whenever Jeffrey hit him, he like spun around somehow and hit his head on one of those brass taps that were like really hard and maybe it knocked him out and he couldn't pull himself out of the tub. So basically he drowned in the tub. Jeffrey didn't want her to take the blame because he knew that if if Lord Stephen was found in her bathroom dead, that there would be a scandal. So he and she both decided that it was better to move him out, you know. He drowned, so they figured that they could just make it look like he drowned in the lake. So she was um she stayed inside there and cleaned up the mess in the bathroom and Jeffrey pretty much carried Lord Stephen down to the lake and, you know, took an axe, broke up the ice, and threw Jeffrey or threw threw Lord Stephen in the water and then left. So now we have stage fourteen, and this is the antagonist is revealed, and this is when the villain is captured, basically, or it's the final confrontation. So Daisy, believing that this was a terrible accident and neither of them were guilty of murder, she concocted a plan to get Jeffrey out of the country. And she recalled how Piper and Tring, whenever they found that envelope in Lord Stephen's room, the one that had ship tickets in it, she knew that obviously those two guys were not going to be on that ship and so there are two tickets available for that ship. She has him go pack his bags really, really fast. They need to get this all done and taken care of before the inspector comes back. And he's due back any moment, of course. She knows that Hugh, uh, Hugh Menton, he owns businesses in Brazil. And he could offer Jeffrey a job, basically, and 
and Daisy went and talked to him and the Earl and he, you know, they discussed everything. And at first the Earl wasn't very happy about it because he thought that Jeffrey should stay and face his punishment like a man. When the chief inspector did return, Daisy told him what had happened and he was furious. And she gave him all the sort of details, and he's like, You little idiot. You are now an accessory to this murder. <laughs> Eventually, after hearing all the facts, all the little sordid details, he agreed that it is an unfortunate accident, and, you know, he's he feels bad, but he has to contact that ship and make him come back to port because Jeffrey needs to face the consequences of his actions. He needs to do the right thing, but what is the right thing anymore, you know? It's like gray area, basically. And so Daisy had an idea that if he called the commissioner and told him everything that happened, the commissioner is the one that got him involved anyway, and, you know, they involved him because they wanted to make sure everything was kept secret and out of the local newspapers, basically. And, you know, the commissioner decided that Yes, it was an unfortunate accident, and Jeffrey was basically a boy who was defending the honor of a lady, and he decided that he should not be punished for this, and he pretty much um, believed that Stephen Astwick was a scoundrel and a really, really bad person, and, and pretty much got what he deserved. Uh, if he... <sighs> so now we've come to stage 15 which is justice at last. This is where the characters' lives go back to normal. Justice has been served, the guilty party has been apprehended, or and it's time to let the healing begin and let's mend those fences. So after the commissioner agreed to let the incident rest, the remaining family, you know, they had a great sigh of relief and they got together in the manor that night and the chief inspector was able to close the case and he was also able to close the other case, the jewelry heist case, the jewelry theft case, because it was clear that Stephen Astwick was a guilty party in this for sure, but they also realized that, um, and then they went back to the police station to talk to the manservant. He pretty much admitted to everything um, as soon as he found out that Stephen was dead, and he is going to go to jail. Uh, he was definitely complicit in it, and he is going to jail. So, basically, they discovered that these men were going to all these big balls in the area, the big parties, and they were there with the intent to steal jewelry from the ladies that were attending the parties. Now, I did mention a few historical facts, like, in, in between there, but I kind of lost it in the middle there because there just wasn't a lot to do, but I've added it to the end of this. Um, the historical aspects women from the 1920s. Um, so you, I probably didn't mention this before, but Joseph, not Josephine, um, Marjorie was the quintessential flapper, right? She had the pencil dresses and short pencil dresses and the short bobbed hair and, you know, the bright lipstick and smoking and dancing at those parties, um, like jazz parties and stuff like that. So uh, and this is because women back in the 20s, they were enjoying their new status in society. So the 19th Amendment gave some women the right to vote. The characters in Daisy's world reflected that for sure because of, you know, Marjorie Flapper. And, and the characters in the book were all fictitious, but they do mention some real people in the beginning when she was reading the newspaper and talking about Mussolini and, you know... Um, King Tut, because obviously he was a real person way, way, way back when. I don't know. But Daisy lived in a world where she was born into a wealthy family. Her father had passed away. The women couldn't stay there, couldn't stay in the home. So um, basically her cousin inherited the house. And so she moved away. Her mother lived somewhere. I can't remember where her mother lived, but she did not want to live with her mother. She did not want to live with her aunt and uncle. She didn't want to live with her sister. You know, she was offered all these places to go to, but, you know, she wanted to be the independent woman. You know, it's the 20s, you know, and, you know, she could make it on her own, and she didn't need no man to do that. 
the dialogue gave an indication as to what time frame they were living in as well because they use um you know the catchy phrases from way back when like the the utter cat and cats amongst the pigeons now and then they would use the words like scarper or rido and old chap so they use the slang from the day so it's telling um, the historical significance of the conflict itself. Um, Lady Annabelle was worried about getting put out of the house because, you know, Stephen was trying to create this scandal. And had he succeeded in it, if had he succeeded in assaulting her, it would have been it would have been her to suffer the consequences because, as you know, he was uh, preparing to scrub her. I really don't know what that word means, but that's what they used. They said that he was, um, he had that ticket on the ship and he would have been like sipping mojitos in Mexico or somewhere. Um, not really Mexico. He was going to Brazil. Um, so he'd be shipping whatever served as mojitos there. <laughs> so any hint of scandal could have, um, could have ruined her life, basically. It could have ruined her marriage. He could have divorced her, kicked her out, whatever. You know, she'd be left with nothing because that's how it was back in the day, back in those days anyway. Um, a woman, yeah, they had the right to vote, finally, some of them, not all of them, just some of them, and they could have a job, but most of the jobs that they did were, like, secretarial stuff, like, you know, the inspector asked her, asked Daisy, to work as a, a stenographer, which is kind of like a secretarial thing. Um, and the reason why she invented this Mr. Coswell to be her photographer is because her editor in the paper, or her editor in the, the magazine, didn't believe that a woman could be a photographer. And so that's why she made him up. And when she'd get to the assignments that she had, you know, through him, um, she would say that, I'm sorry, but Mr. Coswell has taken ill and I, I'm going to be taking my own pictures. So, and that's how it worked. So that's very clever of her, really. Um, I don't know what's going to happen whenever the editor, you know, gets smart and says, I, I want to meet this man. <laughs> I guess we didn't think that far ahead, did we? Yeah, Daisy was hell-bent to make it on her own. I keep putting song lyrics into this. I don't know why I do that. My brain is fried. I need to stop. The next video in the series is going to come in a couple of weeks, and it's going to be the animal-themed cozy mystery. And I've already started reading the next book, well, listening to the next book. And it's called Death by Chocolate Lab, and it's a Lucky Paws pet sitting mystery series, and it's written by Bethany Blake. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you did, and if you, this is the kind of content that you like to watch, please consider subscribing. Um, and I know if you're still here, you may as well just click that button because, I mean, you've been here for a long time, unless you're just like using me as background noise. I will see you in two weeks when I post the next one, and... Saturday afternoon live streams where I do writing sprints and I usually do that on Saturdays from 1 to 3 and Central Standard Time. Thank you so much for coming by and I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video, okay? Bye.